Today we're going to continue on with our mini PC build. We already have Windows by default. Now we need to add some Linux. Hello everyone, Chris here, and yes, now we're going to continue on with our mini PC build. In the last one, we installed KVM over IP with Tiny Pilot so that we can access that PC in a more console-like environment. It did come with default Windows 10, but now we need to add some Linux to this whole configuration. And we've been without a server down here in the basement for a while now, so I've been unable to help a lot of people with their Linux or Windows Octoprint installs or make any content on it with the newer versions. So that's my intention with this whole series, is to get back to creating more content like that. And with Linux, there is an environment in Windows now that you can install it directly in Windows, and it works pretty well. And we could go over that configuration if people are interested, but I think it makes more sense to have a Windows version and then a Linux version side by side. You can boot one or the other in a dual boot scenario. I just like keeping them isolated so it's easier for me to show you how to do a dedicated install in either operating system. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through all the steps of installing dual boot Linux on a regular PC like the mini one that we have here. So let's jump right into it. So for this install, I will be doing all of this remotely. Remember, we have our tiny pilot we can use as a KVM that we can access our PC. This will be more for the boot up of Linux so we can see what's going on like a console. We can watch it reboot. And then I also use VNC for kind of the same purposes. It runs a little faster than tiny pilot does, but you can't see all that reboot action. You just have to wait for it to come back up. So I'm gonna be using both to do a lot of things on that mini PC. You could also use remote desktop. There's a couple different options out here, whatever you're comfortable with, just to get all these tasks done. I also am going to stress you shouldn't do this on a computer that you're not prepared to do this on. You could mess up the hard drive and corrupt your Windows install pretty easily because we are going to have to shrink this file system a bit to make some room for Linux. So if you're not sure what you're doing, get a hard drive to do this on that you don't care about, something like that. Don't do it on your daily driver PC. You might corrupt your data. So the first thing we need to do is shrink that file system down. So we're on our mini PC. I'm just going to go to Creates and Format Hard Disk Partitions. Now the drive on the mini PC is pretty small. It's 128 gig. But what we want to do here with Windows and Linux, we're not going to install a lot of applications or anything. That should be more than enough space for us to get anything we need done. Now there's a lot of great guides on how to do this dual boot scenario out there on the internet. I'm just going to walk you through the steps that I know how to get this done. There's probably a lot of different ways, but this is probably the most straightforward way for me to tackle something like this. So we want to share space with this Windows drive, this C drive right here. So basically all we're going to do is use this tool to shrink it. So up here where it says Windows C, we're just going to right click and hit shrink volume. Make sure it's your main data volume. It should be the one that has the most space in it, not your recovery volumes. And here's our shrink options. So you get the total before the shrink, the size available to shrink, and then the amount to shrink it. We don't need a ton for Linux, so let's shrink it by 50,000. That will give us more than enough room to get a copy of Linux up and running. And now we have this unallocated space that we can use for our Linux partition. And let's go ahead and throw a format on that real quick. Kind of keep this in the back of your mind, this 4883, when we get into Linux, so we know roughly which partition we're going to install Linux on. So we'll just right click this unallocated space. Let's do a new simple volume. Really doesn't matter what format you put on it. We're going to use all the space. D drive is fine, whichever one you have available. And we'll just format it NTFS. Quick format and finish. With the format, now at least the system will know about it. Now we need to head out and grab a copy of Linux so we can install it here in our new partition. The flavor of Linux that I prefer is Ubuntu. Now you can grab the desktop version that has a GUI that you can use. I usually don't do that. I usually just get server because most of the stuff we do is command line. Also, you need a tool to be able to build a bootable disk or drive to be able to load onto your new PC. I use pendrivelinux.com, this universal USB installer. There's a couple of good ones out there like Rufus. 
I'll leave all the links to this in the description. But if you use Pendrive Linux, it will actually download the newest version for you here. You can select whichever one you want. I prefer just to go download it myself, but if you want it to download it for you, that's no problem at all. Just check this box and pick whatever drive you want. I like to come out here to the site, go up here to server, take a look at what my server options are, and we're just going to do manual server install, and then download the currently long-term supported version, which is 2004.3. So that's the one we're going to install. And we'll wait for that to download. And while we're waiting, I also wanted to mention about Windows and Linux dual installs. If you're going to do a setup like this, you always want to install Windows first. Because that Windows install, if you had Linux on the machine already, Windows is going to want to format that drive and move things around how it sees fit. So it's probably going to corrupt that Linux install. So if you do something like this, Windows first, then Linux. Alright, back to the config. Our download is done. I'm going to go ahead and select Ubuntu server installer and then I'm going to browse for the ISO that I downloaded. Here it is right here. Hit open. And then we'll select the USB drive we want to use. I'm just using a thumb drive. I believe it is 16 gig, but probably anything over four nowadays might be big enough. It's hard to even get a four. So eight and up should be fine. And here's mine down here, disk two, F. And I'm just going to let it format FAT32. And we'll wipe entire disk. And let's create it. It's going to give you all the information about it, what it's going to look like after you're done. So we'll hit yes. It's going to go through a bunch of steps. Right now it's extracting the ISO so we can put it on the drive. This takes a little bit, probably about 10-15 minutes. And that went actually much faster than I remember it taking. It only took a couple minutes. So now our USB drive is done. We can go mount it on our mini PC. Now it shouldn't matter what port you put it in, it should be able to pull up a menu that we can choose which one to boot from. That's where this KVM over IP is going to come in really handy. Jump back to mini PC just for a second to confirm that it mounted. It did. It's calling it disk one. So we should be good to go ahead and shut down and reboot. We'll pull up Tiny Pilot so we can see the reboot. Now, it depends on what type of PC you have. Sometimes you have to strike a key to get the boot menu to come up. Other times, it will notice that USB is bootable and bring up a menu for you. If you have to strike a key, try F12, F10, F2. Those are the usual suspects. Or consult your manufacturer. On mine, I just hit Escape because I wanted to kind of look around in the BIOS anyway. So we'll head over to Boot. And on a PC like this that I do a lot of these different configurations, maybe I load Linux multiple times, sometimes I'll just make that USB drive the first boot option, and then leave the hard drive as the second. So when it's present, it'll boot. So I'm going to make boot number one our USB device, and then second will be the hard drive. That should get us into the mode where we could start installing Linux. And we can save changes and exit. Now it's going to restart, and you can see it's already gone into Linux. So we're going to install Ubuntu Server. That's the default option. It should just go ahead and load. So when it boots up, it's going to go through a lot of command lines, some Linux here. It might look a little intimidating, but no big deal. It's just getting everything ready on that USB key to run it one time. If you did the desktop version, it does have a little better interface for install. The menus are a little clearer. The server is a little archaic, because most of the time they do this through automation, but I'll walk you through it. So the first thing we come to, what language do you want to run in? English. And then you can go through your keyboard layout. English US is set by default on both of mine, so I'm just going to hit done. And then your Ethernet interface. The mini computer, we just do Wi-Fi, just to make it more convenient for us. The DHCP for the fixed Ethernet connection, the hardline connection, uh, that would probably be easier if you wanted to use that, but in the newer versions of the GUI, like this one, you can actually go ahead and set up your Wi-Fi connection. So let's do that. So we'll just arrow through this WLP20S0. That's our Wi-Fi. It says WLAN. We'll hit enter. And we want to edit Wi-Fi. And right here, you can punch in your network name and your password. Case sensitive, of course. And then we can tab down to save and save it. 
This way, it can automatically update as we build. A lot of these builds require a network connection, but you can see up here it already grabbed the IP. So we know we're connected to the internet, we're good to go. So we can go back to done. Proxy, this is if you have to have a proxy to get out to the internet, we don't need it, we can hit done. Use your mirror address, just use the default, we don't have anything specific. This would be like if you had a repro on another server or something like that. So hit done. You can look at the release notes if you'd like. We can go ahead and update to the new installer. I'll let you go ahead and make that decision, but I'll update since we are connected to the internet. We'll let it download everything and get it installed. And on the next screen, this is where you're going to have to set up your storage. You're going to have to pick the drive that you want to use for this dual boot install. And this is where you need to be really careful. So we don't want to use the entire drive. That would wipe out Windows. So let's tab down to custom storage. We'll do a space bar on that, and we'll come down to done and hit enter. And pay attention to the size. That's the easiest way for me to tell which one's which. Remember, when we created this on the Windows side, we were around 48 gig. So this is the partition we want to use. So we'll just hit enter on partition four, and we're going to edit. We want to format it. Remember, we put an NTFS on it. We want to use ext4. And then we want to mount it. So we'll mount it. We want to mount as root, so forward slash. And we'll hit save. Now make sure this all looks good. Up here at the top you see this mount point. You've got the mount for the root directory and then you have this boot EFI mount down there. So it's going to make some changes to the way that Windows uses that boot directory, but it shouldn't impact Windows. From now on, when you boot up, you're going to have a menu with Ubuntu on it, a couple of different options, and Windows that you can go into to bring one or the other up. And that's the change that's going to make that happen. So we'll tab down. This should be all we have to do. And we'll hit done. It's going to give you some warnings, making sure that you have this correct. You don't want to wipe out your Windows install. So do we want to continue? Yes, this is going to make the right. Then, the easier screens. You can put in your name, server name, I'm going to call ours mini underscore Linux. Be careful when you name this stuff, it is all case sensitive, so make it easy on yourself if you can. I'm going to pick a username, we're just going to go with Chris, and then whatever password you would like to use, and we'll go down to done. Next, do you want to install OpenSSH server? This is if you want to use something like PuTTY, an SSH client, to access your server. I always turn this on because most of the time I'm coming in command line, and this is what is going to allow that. I'm not going to mess with importing any keys right now. We could go over that if you really wanted to at some point, but we don't need to do it today. So, tab down to done. And here you can select anything that you might want to add extra. I just want a pretty basic server. I don't need any of this stuff, but if you want to go ahead and install it now during the install process, you can always come back with app get later and install it after the fact. So we'll just go to done. We don't need anything extra. And now it's going to do the install. And this does take a little bit, but we'll come back when it's done. When it's all done, you should see install complete up here, and then you can go down to reboot now. It should tell you but you need to remove that USB key before it reboots so it doesn't try to start that install over. But it should come up after we hit this. Please remove installation media. So we'll do that and we'll hit enter to allow it to reboot. And when you get to the bootloader page, it's going to let you select which ones you want to set. You can also edit these to make one the default if you want it to be Windows default, Ubuntu default. But there's your Windows right there. There's Ubuntu. So let's just go ahead and hit enter. Should see a whole lot of messages, and then we'll get to a login prompt. And here we are, ready to log in. Let's type in Chris and our password. And so far, so good. Let's go ahead and display file system, DF. We'll do dash H. Looks good there. And let's just do a list on root. Looks like everything is intact. Our Linux install is complete. And if you want to go back into Windows, you can just do sudo reboot now. When the menu comes up, I'm just going to hit the arrow key, go to Windows, hit enter, and then Windows is going to start.
Windows is up, we logged in, and our dual boot setup is complete. And this is going to be really handy for a lot of our configuration testing going forward. So there we go, our dual boot install is complete. Now we can use Windows or Linux as we see fit from that menu as the computer boots up. Now there is one more thing I'd like to do when I install Linux so that I can be able to recover from previous configurations in case I mess something up. It'll get you back to square one like we are right now with a fresh install. And I like to use time shift. So we'll just putty into our new install of Linux and all you have to do to install it under Ubuntu is do a sudo apt install time shift. That will get it installed. I already have it here, so I don't have to wait for that process. But time shift is basically using rsync to create restore points, and then you can restore back to those if you wish. So right after my fresh install, I like to just do sudo time shift dash dash create and dash dash comment. And I just put something in here so I know which one it is. Let's call it fresh install. And there's a lot of different tags or options you can use here. I just like to do one time. You can actually schedule these for a day, week, month, whatever you want to do. I just want a one time backup. So we'll just hit enter. Our partition isn't very big, so it should only take a minute or two to complete. We've created our on demand snapshot. You can do sudo time shift dash dash list to see which backups you have and you see there's the one we just took I took one a little while ago after the install but this can be really handy to get you back to square one if you mess up one of your configurations and if you want to restore it all you have to do is sudo time shift dash dash restore it's gonna let you pick which restore you'd like to do let's just restore the one we just made so number two we have to enter a couple of options. We'll just hit enter here. Do we want to reinstall Grub? Go ahead and do it just in case it got damaged while you were doing some of your other setups. It shouldn't hurt anything. And you want to make sure that you are restoring that ext4 that we created earlier in this video. This one right here. So SDA4. So we'll go with one. And there is no warranty to this software. So if you're okay with that, go ahead and hit yes. And it's going to go through a restore process and then it's going to reboot. Another great reason to have your KVM over IP with Tiny Pilot handy. So now it's rebooting. We can see it in the console. And once the reboot is complete, our restore is done and you should be able to go ahead and start your config again, just like it was a brand new install. This can be really handy in case you mess things up. So just a bit of a side tip. So there we go, our dual boot is complete and this is gonna be a great base setup going forward. I don't have to use another PC and potentially damage it while I'm doing testing in both Windows and Linux. And it should enable me to help a lot of other folks troubleshoot their configurations. And I promise this will be the last non 3D printing specific video for a while. So that's all for today. Hopefully you found this helpful and I'll see you really soon on the next one.